do I have a treat or a curse for you guys? It's one of the two. So like seven or eight months ago, I ended up making a video about a movie that had kind of been gaining some notoriety on the internet because of uh, a director or like the studio kind of hunting down some bad reviews, trying to false claim the videos on YouTube for using any footage from the movie itself, even if it was from the trailer. And it was all just kind of, I wanted to say that it was link to the bad reviews, but I don't know if there are any good reviews of this movie to compare it to. And it's not swiped. Some of you might've been like, oh my God, it's a follow-up to swipe. But no, we're talking about Daniel Ferens, the mind behind the haunting of Sharon Tate. Now, I just mentioned this movie in my best and worst of the decade. And on that video, someone was like, have you watched the follow-up? Did you watch the murder of Nicole Brown Simpson? And I was like, oh my God, that already came out. I remember it being on the list of things he was working on when I was doing my video on Sharon Tate, but I can't believe it's already out. So I decided to subject myself to it so you guys wouldn't have to. And just to give you guys just a bit of a rundown, if you didn't watch my uh, original video, but I do recommend watching my original video. I had a good time with it. Uh, it's essentially a story that recreates the Manson murders, but tries, in his words, in the director's words, give the power back to the people who lost their lives by giving Sharon Tate psychic premonitions. It includes actual crime footage from the murder scene and all the different news reportings. It gets very gratuitous with the violence and then obviously just the concept of her having these supernatural experiences is, it's atrocious. Daniel did send a letter off to the Tate estate, Tate sister, but it mostly had more to do with what the murders meant to him and how it affected his life and how it changed him going forward, even though he was born months after it happened. It honestly reads like some kind of edgy kid who's decided to make their life defined or marked by some kind of tragedy that they had absolutely nothing to do with. Now, the interesting thing about him is that when he makes these movies, he keeps trying to say that it's to give the power back to the people or the victims. But then he shoves in all of this supernatural stuff, doesn't really give any power back to the victims, and it's mostly just extremely insulting to the people that are still around. So like the Sharon Tate stuff was bad enough. There are still so many people who knew her well, who were close to her, her family's still alive. So when you get criticism for doing something around an event that happened in 1969 and making a total joke out of it, the logical conclusion is obviously to go 25 years into the future and, and look at the Nicole Brown Simpson murder case. Cause yeah, anyway. So yeah, let's let's just get to the movie now. Yay, the movie. They they got Mina Suvari. They got Mina Suvari, who I was just wondering the other day while re-watching American Pie, what happened? To Mina Savari. She was in so many things and she's great. And she is literally, she's the highlight of this crap fest of a movie. Spoiler alert, it's a crap fest of a movie. But now I sadly know what happened to Mina Savari. Girl, why? You were an American beauty, why? <laughs> Again, it kind of starts off with using some actual footage from the crime scenes and from the event itself that happens, which I just find is very tasteless because it's almost like you're trying to portray what you're putting to screen as a definitive fact, as something that actually happened, and maybe make people feel like it's some kind of like blended documentary with a narrative film but it's not. So it starts with her at a party. She's being stalked by OJ's Jeep and looking out the window. And then she actually has a conversation with Chris, who at the time was not a Jenner, but Chris, current Jenner, where she blatantly says, I feel like he's going to kill me someday and get away with it. And that's gonna be a theme going throughout this movie. There's these weird themes where the movie is simultaneously trying to say that OJ didn't do it and that OJ did do it or that he was involved in it happening somehow. There's just, I, I get that in real life, there's a lot going on with the story too, but it, if you can't tell a cohesive, clean narrative, you probably shouldn't be making a narrative driven film about an actual tragedy that happened you know, really not that long ago. Anyways, then it cuts to her just talking about how she's being stalked, how, you know, Simpsons always hang out in outside the house in the bushes and all these different things. And at this point, you can definitely tell that they took a lot from Faye Resnick's book talking about her uh, friendship with Nicole. As it's progressing on, it just feels like a lifetime hallmark horror movie, except it's trying to deal with one of the most notorious murders in modern history. So as it goes on, Faye follows her home as they realize that all this crazy stuff's happening. And then it kind of shows that Faye's about to like start making out with her before they, they hear noises outside. So that's really just amping up again, something that is, as far as I know, only in Faye Resnick's book, saying how they at one point decided they were gonna swear off men, but weren't gay, but just had some sexual experiences 
together. While also simultaneously earlier in the movie pointing out that Ron Goldman would have been a good romantic partner to venture towards, even though most of all the news reportings just say that they were platonic friends. So anyways, it cuts to the next day where she's finishing up a run with Ron and she walks by her neighbor's house and notices somebody kind of cleaning up a bunch of painting supplies. He seems kind of aggravated as he's doing it. So logically, she's like, hmm, I'm doing some renovations in my home. Would you just like to walk into my giant empty condo with me so you can look around and see if you can finish the work that my friend started and hasn't finished even though I don't know who you are? Because she's convinced that she has a stalker and that somebody's following her around and she doesn't feel safe. So the logical thing to do is invite a grown man that she doesn't know into her home while she's alone. Daniel, I thought you said you were being respectful to the victims, not making them seem like goddamn idiots. Anyway, so the place ends up getting broken into. A bunch of her tax forms are taken. This is later implied that, you know, OJ broke in so that he could try to use it as ammunition to get the kids back from her or that she'd have to like give up her place and move back in with him. But she ends up getting a new security system. And of course the painter dude notices the code she puts in because he understands how to use it. And before we can focus on how sinister it is that he's clearly just looked over her shoulder to see what the security code is, they start banging. Now again, this painter guy is Glenn Rogers. For those of you who don't know, Glenn Rogers was arrested for murders committed in the uh, same area. And a lot of people do think that he was uh, either involved in the murder because OJ hired him or if he just did it of his own accord or if, you know, some people are like he wasn't involved at all. But either way, that is how they introduce him into this as the handy dandy painter who she ends up screwing, even though as far as I can tell from what I've looked into, I can't find any evidence that ever suggested that that happened. Again, you say you want to be respectful to your victims and you're just, you're going to do this? Anyways, after they bang, it cuts to her waking up to sounds of him downstairs talking to himself like a complete maniac, going back and forth talking to a Charlie. He's literally down in the living room just ranting to himself buck naked. Cause yay, we love a lazy mental illness story where we're trying to say that somebody has multiple personalities while we're dealing with a really serious crime that was committed not that long ago. So she obviously gets creeped out, tries to notify the police, he knows the code, but that doesn't even end up panning out to anything because the cops end up showing up anyways. And then the cops blame her. Now, this is the area where he's like, you know, I'm trying to point out the fact that the cops, you know, were victim blaming in this situation because OJ had a lot of friends in the department and that this is something that happens to victims. Like, yeah, that is something that happens to victims. Doesn't change the fact that like everything else you did in this movie is highly disrespectful. I don't think it's quite as disrespectful as what happened in The Haunting of Sharon Tate, but it's, it's still pretty bad. Either way, they're kind of blaming her and she again points out, you'll feel sorry when he kills me, referring to OJ. Lots of blatant things where she's saying that he's gonna kill her. So then after this, we get this long stalker montage where sometime like Glenn is stalking her and then she's trying to follow him and she bumps into a family, but it takes like way too long and nothing really comes of it. Then it cuts to her at the neighbor's house because she's trying to figure out like, okay, you hired him first. Do you have more information about him? But then it's the neighbor's brother being like, sorry, uh, I really can't help you because she's missing. And then you find out she's not just missing, she's she's dead. So then cuts to Glenny Boy at a bar where a girl calls him Charlie, as if everybody other than Nicole knows that this dude's name is Charlie. And then it cuts to what you assume is them doing it in the back of a car, but it's actually him murdering her. Now, the reason why he's being called Charlie through most of this, I'm going to get to at the end and we're going to tie it together and just point out that it's there's some, there's some licenses taken with this film for something that at one point was branding itself a true story, but you know, we'll get here. At this point, you're like, okay, well, this is at least more of a mundane, grounded story. None of this weird supernatural stuff that was happening in the Sharon Tate one, which makes it a little bit more tasteful. And then she gets attacked by some demon ghost that she can't see. Like she's in the bath and then she's suddenly being thrown all over the place. She's up against the ceiling. Her head's getting smacked into the wall and she's finally like dropped and all the lights are flickering. And then she looks down and there's like blood coming out of her hoo-ha it looks like after she had been like slammed against a wall in very weird ways which is leading me to wonder like did she just get sexually assaulted by a ghost but anyways she's like crawling across the floor and then it cuts to her just waking up in the tub so you're like oh it was just a dream she was having a dream and you wanted to add in some some spooky stuff that didn't really fit the narrative of the story but she's got bruises in all the places where she would have been slapped around so did something supernatural happen or not did you what why? Daniel, I really want to know. All other things aside, if I if I want to just take a benefit of the doubt and say that you do truly care about these stories and giving the victims a a a 
proper send off or just some kind of chance to show that they were more involved in the things happening than we might realize. What made you think this was a good idea? What was your mindset behind that scene? I need to know. Because if your answer is anything other than like, oh, well, I thought it fit into the horror side of things, I think you're lying because there's no other reason to have it. I know that according to uh, the actual Glenn's brother, I think his name is Clay, when he's talking about it, it's like, oh, my brother literally thinks there's like a demon inside him that needs to, that's going to be passed on. So I don't know if they're trying to amp up that side of things, but there's just so much going on in this movie while simultaneously it feels like nothing is going on in this movie. It cuts to her at her therapist office retelling all of this story, essentially from the time that she meets Glenn on, which is very annoying and not necessary for the viewer because we've been along for the entire ride. You can just cut to the part where she's like, I don't even know how I got these bruises. I just, I feel like I went to hell and back. And then have the therapist thinking that she's speaking metaphorically, but she's like, nah, doc, I heard demon noises when I was getting tossed around. And again, that just reminds us to, we have no idea how these bruises actually happened if that was a dream. I would like to remind you all that this movie billed itself as the shocking, true story of the most notorious murder of the century. Demon dragging, true story. So then it cuts to them at the kids' school recital and OJ shows up, you know, to see the little kitties. And then after it's done, he kind of like, confronts her, but then it hits the moment where I believe in the director's mind, he thinks this is me giving the victim a voice. So she just goes off on him being like, did you think that if you reported me to the IRS, I would suddenly have to come running back to you even though I bought that condo with my own money? And you only come around the kids when you wanna get to me, you're a horrible father. Like, I don't know if that was supposed to be her moment of taking control back, but you know, the rest of the movie just hurts that for you. So then she leaves and when he's walking back to his Jeep, you know, the one we saw earlier, kind of stalking her around, uh, he bumps into Glenn and he says, Charlie? As if he already knew who he was. And again, we'll get into why that's kind of ridiculous. Then OJ goes back to Stalker Town. He ends up going to the restaurant. Somebody tips off Ron, so he leaves and then goes to Nicole's house to be like, yo, you know, OJ was just at the diner. And then before this can really go too far, they're immediately getting stabbed. And I would just like to point out that I think the first shot of this movie is her going for a run. And then this guy wearing kind of like a mask over his face or just like a ski mask type thing. It just walks out and starts walking. And you can very clearly see these white because it shows the back of his neck. And I think that it's trying to imply that for some reason this dude was stalking her before she had even mentioned, like it's like, I don't, I don't know. There's a lot going on here. So he's basically the person who ends up murdering them is the same person who was kind of walking at her earlier on because we're wearing the same jacket, we're in the same ski mask, and, and then it just kind of goes on from there. So again, the murders are happening and it does that bad slow motion shit that I made fun of in the last video again. And uh, it's he slits Nicole's throat in, in, in slow mode. And then she just starts brutally bleeding out and just crawling away. How did this get funded? Like she has kids that are now just like, they're only in their thirties and like they had to deal with that all happening when they were kids and now they have to put up with this bullshit being made, come on. And then again, the movie starts flipping towards actual news coverage of the crime scene and all sorts of stuff that really just doesn't belong in this kind of movie. It shows a clip of the brother saying that he believes Glenn is guilty of these murders. And then mentions conversations that he had with Glenn where Glenn says that OJ hired him to do something or to steal from her and to break in and that he might have to kill her if it came to it. All sorts of weird stuff. I would like to point out that investigators in Los Angeles say that they are unequivocally believe that it is OJ that did this, but this movie is clearly trying to leave you with a more open natured, actually it's, it's trying to tell you flat out who did it. It's just letting you know that potentially there was some other involvement. And then one of the last shots it leaves on when it's doing one of these flashbacks is when OJ kind of recounts his side of things and says that he ran into somebody who said their name was Charlie. So this movie is essentially trying to take OJ's story of someone named Charlie being outside the house and blending that with the real person, Glenn Rogers, who is known as the Casanova killer or the cross country killer who was arrested at the, around the same time. Basically just putting out there that he has multiple personalities. It's not even gonna try to do the, he might've just lied about his name. I don't know. That's the main area where this story, in my opinion, gets really disgusting. Cause not only does it start making all of these weird assumptions of like multiple personality disorders, trying to say that Nicole had sexual relations with him and a bunch of other really gross stuff that is just like assumptions. Like it's the kind of stuff that people would put in conspiracy theory videos, but then you're putting it 
in a movie that you're trying to say is giving the victims back their power. I'm gonna be honest, man, you need to stop trying to give victims back your power because you're not succeeding. In my opinion, Tarantino's completely fictional Once Upon a Time in Hollywood made me feel more for Sharon Tate as a person and what a beautiful legacy she had than your entire movie claiming that you're giving her her power back while Hilary Duff's just running around screaming about premonitions the entire time. And then this movie, in a, a very, very tasteful fashion, ends off with 9-11 calls that Nicole Brown Simpson had made to police officers, and that's just how it plays out to the end of the movie. Because again, we're being respectful here. I don't know, man. I hope they don't pull the same shit where they start flagging bad reviews of this video for just using any kind of footage from it, even if they're getting it from the trailers and it 100% falls under fair use. I'm hoping at this point he's done with this style of movie. I think this concludes his unholy shit trilogy. So yeah, that is The Murder of Nicole Brown Simpson. One of the other movies that will very, very, very well make it onto the list of why the hell was this made? And I would really just like this director to admit what his actual intentions are with these or he's just actually those are his actual intentions and he's just so bad at doing it that this is what we end up with. Boring movies that are just insanely insulting to everyone involved. So yeah, here's just a quote to let you know that I'm not crazy when I say this is his intention. We wanted to present Nicole as a real person, a woman of strength and conviction, and not just a victim of a series of horribly tragic circumstances that ended in her untimely death. I have my Haunting of Sharon Tate video linked somewhere that also has the link to the, the letters that he allegedly sent to Sharon Tate's sister to try to express to her that he wasn't actually being as disrespectful as he clearly was. I want to believe that your intentions are in the right place, but at this point, I feel like enough people have told you that you're wrong and that maybe you should listen to them. And if you're really passionate about this stuff, do the documentaries. You did a bunch of documentaries about horror movies, but why can't you do documentaries about like the real events? You're doing documentaries about things that aren't real and you're doing like weird exploitation horror movies about things that are real. I don't think that's the legacy you want to go forward with. In my opinion, maybe it is. That is going to do it for today's video. Let me know what you guys are thinking in the comment section down below. Have any of you guys caught this? Did anybody catch The Haunting of Sharon Tate? I'd be very interested to know your thoughts down below.